Good evening, everyone. How are you all? <clears throat> Welcome to First Aid AMC MCQ, free two week sessions again. So, so far you have got few of our classes, right? So, you had our psychiatry trial class. You had a very recently we have taken a question solve tips and tricks. And today we are going to do a theory session with you. So that will be mainly focusing on cardiology. So you will, you will understand how our theory classes work. So you will have two cardiology class with me. And after that, just on, on 14th October, you will have a recent question solve class with one of our other mentor. And then we will do a cardiology question solve class. And also then there will be another class which will be a just a recent sample question discussion as well. So that's the schedule that we have provided you for the free two week session. So I'm hoping that you are enjoying the session so far. Just like always, if you have any questions, you can always write it in the chat box or some of you still are in Facebook. So normally we don't take classes on Facebook. So it's just for this two week session. So I would always ask that if you can come, come join the Zoom sessions. It's very really easy, very really comfortable. You can easily interact with us. So that's the better option. So let's start with cardiology. Cardiology is very important topic for your exam. And I can't say enough that how important it is. Now, we might not be able to finish each and everything from cardiology. We will try to do all except the ECG. So ECG is not a part of two-week session. Once the two-week session is over, only the course students will get the ECG class, which is also very important for cardiology. So let's start with cardio. So first of all, let's just have a look on the video that how our heart works. I'm sure all of you know it, but still, let's have a look. The normal heart has two sides, a right side and a left side, and four chambers, the top receiving chambers, or atrium, and the lower chambers, which are thick-walled pumping chambers called the ventricles. Red blood cell will come from either the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava and enter into the right atrium. The blood then flows across the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. The right ventricle then squeezes and ejects that blood cell into a vessel called the pulmonary artery pulmonary artery splits into two vessels, each going to the lungs. As that red blood cell makes its way through the lung, it returns through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. That blood is now oxygenated. It's picked up oxygen, then goes across the mitral valve into the left ventricle, which does most of the work in terms of delivery of blood flow to the body. That blood cell is now ejected into the aorta to some organ or muscle or skin in the human body. All right, so this is a very, very easy way to talk about cardiology, and it's mainly the, the, the anatomy of cardiology, how it actually works. Before I move on to cardiology, I would just like to discuss a little bit about the cardiac anatomy and physiology, which is important to understand, because if you don't have a good basic idea on physiology of heart, then learning something like this, it's not actually beneficial. So let's have a look, and then we will come to, come to the research and everything. So basically, your heart is one of the main, main organs in your body, right? So if this is your heart, and heart has got four chambers, as we know. So we know that this is right atrium. That's our right ventricle left atrium, left ventricle. So blood will come from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. So superior vena cava will carry all the bloods from the upper extremity and inferior vena cava will carry bloods from the lower extremities. So all of your, all of your venous blood, which is deoxygenated, those blood will come into your right atrium. Through the right atrium, blood will move into the right ventricle through your pulmonary valve. So you have got pulmonary valve here. Sorry, tricuspid valve. My bad. So 
Blood will move from right atrium to right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. And then from right ventricle, your blood will move through the pulmonary artery into the lungs. So in here, you have got your pulmonary valve. Okay. So from right ventricle through the pulmonary valve, deoxygenated blood will move into the lungs. So let's say this is the lungs. So what will happen in the lungs? In the lungs, the, the deoxygenated blood will become oxygenated and then through the pulmonary vein. So let's just change the color of it so that you can understand. So now the oxygenated blood will move into your left atrium. So this is oxygenated blood and that's the pulmonary vein. Okay. So through the pulmonary vein, oxygenated blood will move into left atrium and from left atrium, it will go to the left ventricle by mitral valve. And from left ventricle, then it will go to your aorta through the aortic valve. And obviously, left ventricle does the most, most of the job. And left ventricle will squeeze, which means it will contract, and it will send all the blood from your heart into, the, into different organs of the body. Okay? So that's how the heart basically works. And there's a lot to learn from here, but we will move on and we will discuss throughout the class. Okay? Now, a few things you will also need to understand that what is cardiac output? Cardiac output is basically the, the amount of blood left ventricle is squeezing out into the aorta and also to the body. That's the cardiac output in a general sense. Cardiac output has, most importantly, cardiac output is basically your ejection fraction. And ejection fraction is important to know the heart function. Okay? So that's, that's the. I can say that that's the, the basic idea that you need to at least understand about the heart. <clears throat> now let's move on to what are the research that we need to follow for cardiology. So obviously JM 8th edition has most of the important topics that you need for your exam. So these are all the chapters that you need to go through. So chapter 30, 59, 75, 6, 7, and 8. We also follow Kaplan step to CK because step to CK is always an integral part. You can say it's your friend along with JM. And any kind of medicine related topic, if you want to know any other Australian guideline, you can go through the RACGP guideline. If RACGP doesn't have that, you can also go through Medscape or eMedicine. Okay? So these are the common two two guidelines that we can follow. If something, something is not there in JM, then we can go through there. And in our lecture note, each and everything which is important, it's already there. And that's more than enough. And we have collected all the important information from both JM and Kaplan. And after that, you can also go through some QBank, like there are QBank related to cardiology, which you can also just go through and and, and solve some questions. So that's the way to prepare for a particular theory related topic. Okay, so let's start our session today then. So first thing that we are going to discuss is chest pain. And if you are asking me that from where I have taken all this research, so all the notes and everything has been taken from your GM and Kaplan step to seek it, okay? And I've got a question. So I don't know what's your name. Your name is showing as FB. So I have added all the things that you require from Kaplan and Kaplan and JM. RSCGP, we can't add everything from RSCGP. RSCGP is, is just a website. So you have to read it by yourself. And we will obviously show you the important topics from RSCGP guideline. Okay. So moving on to chest pain. So chest pain has a lot of differential diagnosis. So what are the main thing that we look for in a patient who presents to us for chest pain? 
And one of you also asking about which chapter of Kaplan. So I can't definitely say you the name, the chapter like that. So if you open up your medicine, medicine Kaplan is to CK, then if you double click on that medicine topic, you will find out cardiology, respiratory, all of those. So just click that on if you want to, which you don't need to at the moment. It, it, you can do it later on when you are reading by yourself. Okay. So let's start with chest pain differential diagnosis first. So chest pain is not necessarily just related to heart. Chest pain can be due to a lot of other organ conditions. So first of all, cardiac related, it could be ischemic heart disease, it could be any of these myocardial infarction, angina, pericarditis. Vascular, aortic dissection is one of the important cause. Respiratory, so pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, pneumothorax, all can be a cause of chest pain. Gastrointestinal, don't forget this because it is common. So esophagitis, esophageal tear, peptic ulcer, all can cause a central chest pain. Musculoskeletal chest pain is also common, especially people who are athletic, people who are heavy lifter, they can come to you with musculoskeletal chest pain. So look for, look for those. And in terms of musculoskeletal, many times it could be a fracture rib, it could be costochondritis, could be cervical nerve root compression, and there are also some others like neurological cause. Someone who has got herpes joster, they can also get pain in the chest. So these are the common causes of chest pain that we want to look for in a patient. Now, first of all, we can see in here that for both stable angina, sorry, just one second. Someone raised hand. So if you guys have any question, you don't need to raise your hand. You can just write it in the comment section. Okay, that should be enough. So first of all, we are just going, going through the initial presentation of chest pain, and then they, they, we will go into different topics. So if a patient has got acute coronary syndrome, or if a patient has got angina, which we can put under ischemic heart disease, right? So in ischemic heart disease patient, either it's a stable angina patient or an acute coronary syndrome like myocardial infarction patient, the chest pain has a definitive pattern of it. So the pattern, the patient will tell you that doc, I'm feeling severe left-sided chest pain, which is radiating to my left arm and jaw and also neck. And if, if you ask that, what is that, how, how is the pain feels like? Or how does the pain feel like? Patient will say, Doc, it, it looks like someone is sitting on my chest. So it feels very tight and heavy. So tightness, heaviness, pressured feeling is usually the cardiac chest pain looks like. Now, many patients who has got ischemic heart disease, the chest pain can have association with nausea, vomiting. They can also have some other features like racing of the heart, excessive sweating. Those are all common features related to it. Now, if a patient presents to you with a chest pain, but it feels like a sharp, sharp knife-like excruciating stabbing pain. So this, th these are the informations which will be given in your stem in the exam. So sharp, knife-like, or stabbing chest pain, that's most of the time go with pericarditis. Okay, so pericarditis pain usually has some relationship with change of posture. So they will say when they lie down, the pain gets worse, and when they lean forward, the pain gets better. So that's also a classic pattern for pericarditis. Now, a patient who has a stable angina, the chest pain duration is also important. So stable angina patient, the chest pain should not persist for more than 10 minutes. When a angina kind of chest pain persists for more than 10 minutes, we are always concerned about a likelihood of a acute coronary syndrome, which can be unstable angina, 
which can be myocardial infarction. So we will go into detail about this angina MI later on. Okay. Now, what if you have got a patient with a chest pain, but the chest pain is having a good response to nitroglycerin. So nitroglycerin is a vasodilator. Okay. So if a patient chest pain gets better with nitroglycerin, it's either it's a cardiac pain or it could be also esophageal spasm. So any of these two can be the cause. But if the chest pain gets worse with nitroglycerin, then think of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, few of the other things, like when you get a patient, it's not just the symptom that always help us to get the diagnosis, it's also the physical examination which helps. Any patient, especially with a chest pain, if the patient is having excessive sweating, respiratory distress, patient looks really anxious, you are always, always, you should be alert about a life-threatening condition. Okay? Now, tachycardia and tachypnea, these two are very commonly found in pulmonary embolism patient. If you check the blood pressure of a patient who is presenting to you with chest pain, and you have got a difference of more than 20 millimeter systolic difference in both arms, it suggests a likelihood of aortic dissection. So what I'm trying to say is that, let's say on the, a patient coming to you with a sudden onset of retrosternal chest pain, which is sharp, severe, excruciating pain, it's radiating to the back, and you have checked the blood pressure. And you found that on the right arm, patient's blood, systolic blood pressure is, let's say, 160. And on the left arm, it is 200. So if there is a difference of more than 20 millimeter systolic blood pressure in both arms, we should be concerned about the likelihood of aortic dissection. Okay? If patient having fever with chest pain, then only thing that we should rule out is pneumonia because that's one of the cause of chest pain or it could be mediastinitis which is not very common few of the other things so sometimes having an abnormal heart sound or murmur can be a important presentation so look for these things so if you have got a patient who has got let's say wide splitting of the second heart sound you can found it in right bundle branch block or right ventricular infarction. Is this very really important for exam? No. So these are some, some ideas, some information that you can retain. If you don't retain it, it's fine. Now, a few things is important. One, anytime if a patient has developed new onset of left bundle branch block. Now, you might be asking that, what is left bundle branch block? That will be discussed in later on in the class okay so any patient who has got a new onset of lb baby with a chest pain you are always concerned about the acute coronary syndrome that's one thing the second thing is that heart sound everyone has s1 and s2 so these are normal heart sound but what if a patient has got s3 or s4 so s3 is mainly it's called s3 gallop rhythm which you get in underlying congestive cardiac failure. What if there is a new fourth heart sound? That also suggests possibility of a myocardial infarction or angina. All right. So these are the important information that you should not forget about. How about you have auscultated the lungs and you have found bivasilar crepitation? Then you should think of likelihood of a CCF. If you have got decreased breath sound on one side and patient having a chest pain shortness of breath, you are thinking about, well, it could be pleural effusion, it could be pneumothorax, it could be even pneumonia, okay? But always we should be concerned about a pneumothorax in such case. So decreased breath sound in a young patient having sh severe shortness of breath, okay? We should be concerned about a pneumothorax. So these are the examination findings that will help you to understand what could be the underlying cause of chest pain.
All right, so you have got a little bit idea about the history physical examination. Now think of what are the investigation that we do in a patient who presents with chest pain. Every patient, remember one thing, each and every patient who presents with a sudden onset acute chest pain should have a ECG done. So that's your initial test for any patient presenting with chest pain. But don't just think that a 10 year old coming to you with a chest pain and when you palpate their chest, it is sore to touch. That might not be a heart attack, obviously. So it's not everyone. You should always use your, your knowledge and idea that when and how we should do this investigation. But most of the patient, especially middle-aged and elderly patient coming to you with a acute chest pain, ECG is a must. Okay. What else we can do? Apart from ECG, there are also some other investigation. So there is CKMB. We no longer do this CKMB anymore because this is not needed. Nowadays, the preferred cardiac enzyme is troponins. So cardiac troponin will be our preferred investigation, especially in, in, a, in a myocardial infarction patient. And sometimes you can do CKMB because it is also cardiac specific and it can be found in acute myocardial infarction. Now, the two things that is important from here is that CKMB, it is usually detectable in the blood of a patient four to six hours after onset of ischemia. So if a patient has got cardiac ischemia, if a patient presents to you after four hours, then you can do this CKMB, and that's usually should be elevated. So CKMB starts to be positive four to six hours after the onset of chest pain, and then it gets normal in two to three days. Okay? Now, how about cardiac troponin? Cardiac troponin also starts to get into the blood in four to six hours, but it can take even a week to get normalized. Okay. Let's have a look to this chart. So you can see that initial investigation is always ECG. And what are you looking for in the ECG? You're looking for any ST elevation, any pathological Q, Q wave, a lot of other things which we'll discuss in ECG class. Myoglobin is no longer our investigations. The only investigations that you can do with ECG is a troponin. So as I said, it, it will start to be in your blood four to six hours after chest pain, and it can last even, you can see, 10 to 14 days. So even sometimes up to two weeks. And CKMB, it will, it will usually get normalized in two to three days. Okay. Now the question comes, if you want to, if you want to find a patient about a reinfarction, so let's say a patient coming to you with sudden onset of chest pain, and then you have done the CKMB and the troponin, you have found it elevated, you have treated the patient. Seven days later, patient presents to you again with chest pain. Now you are not sure if this is a reinfarction or the, the patient just getting the chest pain out of nowhere, or there might be any other cause. Now, the main thing you need to rule out is a reinfarction. So if you want to do, if you want to find this out, which investigation you would prefer, CKMB or, or troponin at that time? Very good. Each and every one of you are right. So not troponin, CKMB. So that's the main thing why I'm taking a little bit of time here. Because if you want to find out reinfarction within this time period, in that case, troponin is not the best idea. Because troponin might be elevated in, in the blood of a patient for even for two weeks. So we always say if we want to do, if we want to find out reinfarction, especially within 
this time period, CKMB is the best test. Okay, but in all other cases, troponin will be the best. Okay, moving on to in a patient with chest pain. So we have done ECG, we know about the cardiac enzyme. The other thing that can be done is a chest x ray. So, chest x ray obviously it will be important for respiratory causes. So, you will be looking for likelihood of pneumothorax, you are looking for pleural effusion, pneumonia. So, those are the things that you can look for. Okay, so so far we know about these investigations also. So, now let's get some important criteria of each of these causes of chest pain, such as if a patient coming to you with a aortic dissection pain. In aortic dissection, patient will come to you with a sharp, tearing, extremely severe chest pain, which will radiate to the back. Okay, then that is the criteria of aortic dissection pain. And a lot of other findings which will be discussed. If you do a chest x-ray, you can get widening of the mediastinum. And if you want to confirm the diagnosis of aortic dissection, you can do this. Either you can do a CT scan or best is transesophageal echocardiogram, which is TOE. Okay, so transesophageal echocardiogram is the best test for aortic dissection. How about pulmonary embolism? Pulmonary embolism, patient always will have some risk factor and patient will come to you with a sudden onset of chest <clears throat> excuse me, sudden onset of chest pain and they will also have shortness of breath. If you do physical examination, you will find out that their heart rate is elevated, their respiratory rate is elevated and they are also having hypoxia. In such case, if you have got some other risk factor of DVT or PE, you can think of pulmonary embolism. There's a lot to discuss about pulmonary embolism, which we will do in respiratory class. How about pericarditis pain? Pericarditis pain, many times it can be just a viral illness causing this viral pericarditis. Also, so a patient will maybe having a recent flu-like illness, and that virus sometimes can also cause inflammation of the pericardium. So a patient will come to you with a sharp pain which is relieved by leaning forward and worse by lying down. And you will find out that patient saying that it gets worse after taking a deep breath or after coughing. So it's kind of a pleuritic chest pain. And then if you check, if you auscultate the heart, you can get a pericardial rub. Okay. And obviously, if you do a ECG, you get a widespread ST elevation. So that's pericarditis pain. And in this table, you can see all the important, important finding about each of these causes of chest pain, such as costochondritis, which is not very uncommon in Australia. This has another name called TJ syndrome. So TJ syndrome is what we call as costochondritis. So when the costochondral junction get inflamed, in that case, if you touch the patient's Costochondral junction, it will be very sore to touch. Sometimes even they can feel a swelling. So swelling on the costochondral junction, it is tender to touch, and pain getting worse with inspiration, that's costochondritis. We know about reflux. Reflux patient will obviously have heartburn. They will complain about regurgitations and reflux. Peptic ulcer, patient will have epigastric pain after eating and they can also get a kind of heartburn history. We will discuss more about MI anyway. Pericarditis we know, we know the dissection, pulmonary embolism. So these are the common ones that we should know of. Okay, so so far we have discussed the common conditions related to chest pain. Any questions so far? Because now we are moving into acute coronary syndrome, which is super important for itself.
Yes, yeah, sometimes Dr. Walker's very good question. Sometimes level of troponin can be assessed also because it is it gets decreased with time. So along with the CKMB, we can do troponin just to get more more better idea. So no questions so far? Anyone? Okay, let's move on to ischemic heart disease. Our today's class will be mainly focusing on this ischemic heart disease because it is super important for your exam. Okay. Now, ischemic heart disease, it is, it is a very common condition. Millions of people in the world are suffering from it, right? So, ischemic heart disease means that your coronary artery, say, let's say that this is the heart, and your heart obviously ha has arterial supply. So let's say this is your left coronary artery, this is the right coronary artery. Ischemic heart disease means that when this coronary artery develops atherosclerosis or fatty depositions, and over the time, this fatty deposition, so you can see that this artery already ha having some fatty deposition. So blood flow to this part of the heart sometimes can, can get worse, especially if a patient does exercise or exertional activities. But what if patient having on like ongoing fatty deposition and at one point, this whole area is blocked. Now there will be no blood supply to this part of the heart. And that is the time when the patient will develop myocardial infarction. And before that, patient was developing either stable or unstable angina, okay? Now, ischemic heart disease can be totally asymptomatic, but most of the time, these are symptomatic. Symptomatic ischemic heart disease has been divided into stable angina, which means stable angina is chest pain that gets worse with exercise or any kind of exertion, but gets better after taking rest. And it usually gets better within 10 minutes. All right. And in that case, you can see still some part of the heart artery or coronary artery will, be, will have a patent blood supply. Now, how about acute coronary syndrome? Acute coronary syndrome includes unstable angina, non-ST elevated MI, and ST elevated MI. Now, unstable angina, non-ST elevated MI, or ST elevated MI, all of these are very severe. But the worst one to get is ST elevated MI, and that usually happens when the full, when there is a full blockage of apes of a single artery or multiple coronary arteries, okay, such as this one. You can see that on the top of the atherosclerotic plaque, they have developed the full blockage here. So when there is a full blockage, that's the time it is ST, ST elevated MI, okay? And unstable angina, non-ST elevated MI, those are very hard to diagnose just by the symptom. We normally can't differentiate just by symptom. We have to do some investigations to find this out. Okay, so we have got a stable angina, we have got acute coronary syndrome, which include unstable angina, non ST elevated MI, and ST elevated MI. Now, what are the risk factors? So, these questions come in your exam. So, if the question can ask you, what is the worst risk factor for coronary artery disease? The worst risk factor is diabetes mellitus, and the most common risk factor is hypertension. Okay? So, these questions are important. Most common risk is hypertension. Worst risk factor is diabetes. And also, you can say that LDL cholesterol is the single most important subgroups that carries risk of ischemic heart disease. So, three type of question. One, that what is the worst risk factor and what is the most common risk factor? 
and what is the most important risk factor okay but if you ask me that which one carries the highest risk of developing ischemic heart disease that's the ldl cholesterol all right now a question for you a 48 year old woman comes to the office with chest pain and that has been occurring over the last several weeks the pain is not reliably related to exertion you can see that this chest pain is not related to exertion she is comfortable now the location of the pain is retrosternal pain sometimes associated with nausea no shortness of breath pain doesn't radiate anywhere and no other past medical history what is the most likely diagnosis reflux unstable angina pericarditis pneumothorax fringe metal angina now you can easily understand that 48 year old women who is having a chest pain which is retrosternal and it is not related to exertion always remember it is very unlikely to have a cardiac chest pain if the chest pain is not related to exertion okay and less than 50 year of age women very less risk to have ischemic heart disease why because estrogen in female that usually protects them from any kind of coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular disease it's not like they can't get it they can get it but it is less common okay so always remember that when a patient has chest pain it is not always always due to heart attack sometimes it could be just a simple reflux and you can see here menstruating women virtually never have myocardial infarction So by the time a woman is 55 to 60, the protective effect of menstruation and naturally occurring estrogen have worn off, and then the risk of coronary artery disease will be equal to men. So before 55, the, there is less risk for myocardial infarction. Okay. So the question in here, which of the following is the most dangerous? to a patient in terms of risk of coronary artery disease. So you can see here, the options are only related to cholesterol. So we already know that LDL, elevated LDL carries the highest risk. And it is one of the worst risk factor which can cause coronary artery disease. Now there is a condition called Tacosubo cardiomyopathy. It's not important for exam. Just remember this because this is a very unusual cause of chest pain. And I have seen one patient who, who had this Tacosubo. So it is a tricky case. You can see a postmenopausal woman develops chest pain immediately on hearing the news of her son's death in a ward. She develops acute chest pain, dyspnea, ST segment elevation in lead V2 to V4. Just by looking at it, it looks like a ST elevated MI, right? Elevated troponin. So if there is elevated troponin, it confirms acute MI. Coronary angiography is normal, including an absence of vasospasm on propagatic testing. Now, the main thing is that when you develop acute MI, and you want to know which artery is blocked, you will do this coronary angiogram. Through the coronary angiogram, you can look directly into the coronary artery and find out how much blockage is there. Now that has come normal, which means there is no blockage in the coronary artery. And how about this vasospasm on provocative testing? So this is done to rule out fringe metal angina. In fringe metal angina, patients develops coronary spasm. So you're trying to rule that out as well. So that's also ruled out. Then you have done an echocardiogram, which shows apical left ventricular ballooning. Now this is a classic picture for tachycardia cardiomyopathy. So it is a acute myocardial damage, most commonly occurs in postmenopausal women. 
immediately following an overwhelming emotionally stressful event, which happens in here as well. So example can be divorce, financial issues, earthquake, anything which is overwhelming and very stressful for a patient. And what it does is that it causes ballooning and left ventricular dyskinesia, which means the left ventricle stops moving as it should be. Okay? And if left ventricle doesn't move, it can't give blood supply to the body. And that's why the patient develops chest pain. As with any ischemic disease, management will be with beta blocker and ACE inhibitor. Okay? So it's just management with symptomatic management with medication. So beta blocker can be given and ACE inhibitors also one of the good ones. Now, the another question, correcting which of the following risk factor for coronary artery disease will result in the most immediate benefit for the patient. Always remember that patient who has coronary artery disease, if the patient can stop smoking, you can see here within a year after stopping smoking, the risk of coronary artery disease decreased by 50%. And within two years, risk reduced by 90%. So this is the single most important thing which patient can do to get immediate benefit, okay? So important for exam, these questions come in your exam. Now, this is the interesting part. So you have got a patient with a sudden onset of left-sided chest pain. And you are thinking that, well, this is, might be a case of acute coronary syndrome. So you have done an ECG. In the ECG, two things can happen. One, that you have got ST elevation. And if you have got ST elevation, you don't need to do anything. Do we need to do a troponin to confirm ST elevated MI? Guys? No, because ST elevations is more than enough to diagnose ST elevated MI. So many times what you do is that you find out a patient with ST elevation MI and you wait for troponin to get raised. You don't have that time. You have to send the patient to catheter lab for angioplasty immediately. Okay, so don't, no need to wait for troponin for that. And many times, if you do troponin in the initial four to six hours, that can be negative, right? So doing a troponin doesn't matter. But what if the patient having ongoing chest pain and in the ECG, you, don't, you haven't got any ST elevation? In that case, it could be either an unstable angina or it could be a non-ST elevated MI. Now, these two, if you want to differentiate, you have to do a cardiac marker. And you do a troponin in here. If troponin positive, that's myocardial infarction, which is non ST elevated MI. If troponin negative, that's unstable angina. Okay? So this is the important thing that you should remember. ST elevation, that's more than enough. We don't need to do troponin. But if it is non ST elevation, but patient having ongoing cardiac chest pain, you have to do a cardiac troponin. So therefore, in establishing the diagnosis of non-ST elevated MI, cardiac troponin should be used to distinguish from unstable angina. Now, the question is, unstable angina and non-ST elevated MI usually have better prognosis than ST elevated MI. All right? The other important thing to know that in ST elevated MI, you get the full block. We call it, like it's a full blockage of the coronary artery. And in that case, thrombolytic therapy. That means either you can remove the clot or you can give some clot dissolving agent, but you have to do some thrombolysis in patient with ST elevated MI.
But in unstable angina or non-ST elevated MI, they don't get full blockage. So there is no indication of doing thrombolytic therapy in these cases. So this is the confusing part. Many candidates, they think that patient has got non-ST elevated MI, you have to do thrombolytics. No. Thrombolytic therapy is only beneficial in patient with ST elevated MI, but it is not effective in either unstable angina or non-ST elevated MI. Okay, remember this thought, we will come into more discussion. Now, we are talking about ischemic heart disease. We already should know about how the pain feels like and everything. So we know that stable angina, the duration of chest pain is less than 10 minutes, and acute coronary syndrome, more than 10 minutes. Most of the time, physical exertion is the provocating factor. Along with the chest pain, patient can get shortness of breath, nausea, excessive sweatiness, dizziness, lightheadedness, right? Quality of the pain, squeezing, tight, heaviness, pressure, but never stabbing knife-like or sharp. And burning is also not usually the chest, ischemic chest pain. Location, it can be sub-external or left, left heart or left chest. Now, you can go through this one that what are the important signs of different chest pain, which we have discussed already? We'll come to this later on. Now, moving on to a more detailed cardiac investigation. This might be a little bit tricky for you, but I hope that you are understanding so far that step-by-step -step approach of investigating cardiac chest pain. So we know that in acute chest pain, it's either ST elevated AMI, or it's either unstable angina or non ST elevated MI, which can be found by doing a troponin. What if it's not an acute chest pain? What if it's an angina patient, like a stable angina patient? Does a stable angina patient also need some more investigations? Yes. So let's say you have got a patient with chest pain occurring after walking. For one kilometer and the pain usually lasts for five to ten minutes pain gets better after taking rest so at the moment patient doesn't have any chest pain but it only comes after exertion so you understand that this is a stable angina so if you need to confirm this what will you do next so that's the time we do more investigation so there are investigations which can find this stable angina and how bad it is. So first of all, you do a stress test, which is called exercise tolerance test. Okay, so try to understand it. So exercise tolerance test or a stress test, it is mainly done when chest pain is there, but you don't know what is the cause of the chest pain. And your ECG is also not picking up any, any kind of ischemic sign. Okay, so patient having chest pain, which is exertional, but when you do the ECG, it's showing nothing. Because at that time, patient is at rest. So you have to do an exercise test, because only during exercise, patient can get the ischemic changes in the ECG. So that's why we are going to send the patient to run on a treadmill and then we will find out if the ECG is showing any changes. And that can be confirmatory for a cardiac chest pain. Okay, making sense? So the two things that you need to be sure before sending the patient to a stress test is are you able to read the ECG? Which means is there any baseline ECG problem? And is the patient can exercise? Someone who has bad osteoarthritis in their knee joint, and you have, you have sent the patient for a stress test, they will not be able to do it. Someone whose weight is 140 kilo, and you have sent the patient for a, a treadmill running, that will not be convenient for them. So it's always important to know if the patient is able to do exercise or not. Okay? So if this two is okay, then you can send the patient for an ETT. And what 
what if you can't read the ECG? So you can understand that the two criteria to send a patient for ETT is one, you, you have to have a normal ECG finding. And second, patient can, patient can exercise. Now let's say the first point, you can read the ECG. So there is some ECG abnormality. So if there is an ECG abnormality, in that case, you can't send the patient for ETT. So if there is a baseline ECG abnormality, the two other method of detecting ischemia is either you can do a nuclear scan, which is either thallium or system AB scan, or you can do an echocardiogram. So what are the main reason of a baseline ECG abnormality? So patient can have a left bundle branch block. Patient can have left ventricular hypertrophy. Patient might be on a pacemaker. So these are the common baseline abnormality in the ECG, which if you have, then you can't send the patient for ETT. So the two options we have is one is a nuclear scan. And what is this nuclear scan? In this nuclear scan, patient, they will put a dye in the patient's vein, and that dye will go into the patient's heart. And it will look at the heart muscle. If, if a part of the heart muscle is not getting enough blood supply, that means that coronary artery is having some blockers. Okay, so let's say that this is your heart, and you have done a dye test. So obviously for the dye to feel the heart, it needs to go through the coronary artery. So let's say if this coronary artery is having some blockage, obviously this part of the heart will have reduced uptake of the dye. Then you will know that, well, this part is supplied by right coronary artery. So right coronary artery having some problem. Okay. So normal myocardium will pick up nuclear isotope such as thallium. But if the if there is any kind of decreased uptake, it suggests possibility of some coronary artery blockers. So that you can do. The other thing is echocardiogram. So in the echocardiogram, you will look for any kind of reduced ventricular wall motion. Having a reduced wall motion also suggests that maybe this part of the heart is not getting enough blood supply. That's why this part is not moving as it should be. So that is called regional wall motion abnormality. So either you can do a nuclear scan or a echocardiogram if, the, if there is an abnormality. Okay? Clear everyone this part? Dr. Faizia and Dr. Muid, all good? Yes, so these are the tests where patient will be exercising. So, in a short way, if there is a baseline ECG abnormality and you want to find out if there is any kind of angina in this patient, you have to do either a nuclear scan or an echocardiogram, okay? Now, the second point is if the patient is unable to do exercise. So if the patient is unable to do exercise, then there are alternate way. The alternate way is you will give some chemical in the patient's vein that chemical will act like as if patient is doing exercise. So it will increase the heart rate. So what we can do, so you can give dipyridamol or adenosine along with nuclear scan. So if the patient is unable to exercise, then you will give thallium or any of the nuclear scan. But in that case, you will just give that chemical so that it looks like the patient's heart is working. Same you, with the echocardiogram, you can give dobutamine, and dobutamine also will act like the same. Okay, which means that 
if a patient is able to exercise, they will have either nuclear scan or echocardiogram while they're exercising. Okay, but what if they can't exercise? So you have to give something in their body which will act like as if they're exercising. Okay, so some chemical which will increase the oxygen demand, which will increase the heart rate. So either you can give dipyridamol with thallium or a dobutamine with echocardiogram. Okay. Now this chart will give you a good good idea that these are the investigations that we can do. So first of all, exercise tolerance test. Exercise tolerance test, it is the initial test to detect angina. And the baseline criteria is there is no baseline ECG abnormality and patient is able to exercise. The problem is if any of these two is having problem. Let's say patient is able to exercise, but there is baseline abnormality in the ECG. Then either you will do a exercise thallium or a exercise echo. What if patient doesn't have any baseline abnormality of the ECG, but unfortunately they can't exercise. So if they can't exercise, you have to make the heart work. So how you do it? You give dipyridamol with this thallium or you give dobutamol with this echo. Okay, so that's the, that's all the exercise tolerance tests that we can do in a patient with angina. Any, any confusion so far with this? So dipyridamol because patient can't exercise. So if patient can't exercise, you have to do something which will increase the oxygen demand in your body. Because in an angina patient, if you don't do exercise or if your heart doesn't exercise, there will be no ECG changes. So doing this test will, will do nothing. So if your patient can't exercise. So you have to make your heart do, doing something which will look like heart is exercising. So if you give dipyridamol, it will do exactly the same, same thing to your heart as if you are exercising. Okay, so it's a chemical which increase the heart activity or which increase the heart oxygen demand, which happens in an exercise patient. And baseline abnormality means that if you have normal ECG, that means ECG is normal. And baseline abnormality means that, let's say there is a bundle branch block or there is features of left ventricular hypertrophy. Those are the abnormality that you don't want for this patient to have, okay? Now, I don't know who, who is asking this question. Your name is showing as Redmi9. Tell me your name, doctor. And so if ECG is abnormal and also patient is unable to exercise, this is a very tricky situation. It's not only tricky for you, it's also tricky for a specialist. So these are the, these are the very unusual thing. It, sh it will never come in your exam because this is a specialist level question and it will be done by a cardiologist only. So they will most likely take this patient to the hospital and in the hospital under the cardiology, they might just go for more advanced investigations for them. So maybe they will just go for a coronary angiogram rather than doing any of this, okay? If there is baseline ECG abnormality, is it okay to do exercise? The thing is that the patient is not showing features of myocardial infarction, right? By baseline abnormality, it doesn't mean that patient having a, like ST elevation. So yes, it is okay to exercise, but 
obviously it, it will be done in a way so that obviously if there is any kind of severe problem happens there will be resuscitation facility over there Okay, moving on to the next. A man with atypical chest pain is found to have normal nuclear isotope uptake. Okay, so at rest, you have found that this patient having a normal nuclear scan uptake in the myocardium. But on exercise, there is reduced uptake in the inferior wall. So now you can understand why I have discussed everything. So you have got a patient with a chest pain, but obviously ECG was normal. So that's why you have sent the patient for an exercise nuclear scan. So at rest, the dye test shows that patient's heart is taking normal scan uptake. But when the patient has started to do exercise, then there is reduced uptake, which means that this patient having a cardiac problem. You can see here two hours after the exercise. So when patient has got enough rest, the uptake returns to normal. So what does it mean? It means that this patient having a reversible ischemia on the stress test. Okay. So you will now understand what, what is the point of doing all of this. There is an important reason for it. So when a patient gets ischemic changes, during exercise and now you have confirmed it by doing this nuclear scan it means that this patient has got a reversible ischemia on the coronary artery reversible ischemia means that when they do exercise they get ischemic change in the heart and when they take rest the ischemic change is better now this is the person who will need a coronary angiogram why because in coronary angiogram, you can go directly into the coronary artery. So either you, can, either you can do a CT coronary angiogram, where you don't need to do any, anything like this. So in CT coronary angiogram, the dye will go inside the coronary artery, and it can directly find out how much blockage is there. So that's CT coronary angiogram. The best one is the invasive coronary angiogram. And in that case, you will, you will do that classic one. So you will, you will insert that, that a, a flexible tiny wear, and the wear will go into the patient's coronary artery. And you can directly look where exactly is the block. And if the block is more than 70%, the cardiologist can put a stent there. Okay? So this is the people who will need a coronary angiogram to find out how much blockage is there in their coronary arteries. Okay? Now, coronary angiogram, it is used to detect the anatomic location of coronary artery disease. And it mainly able to detect is detect the level of blockage and what you need to do to solve the problem. Does this patient need a bypass surgery or it just a stand put in? So if you look on this chart, you can see that patient having a ischemic heart disease. And then you have done a resting ECG. Is the resting ECG having abnormalities? If there is resting ECG showing abnormalities, in that case, you can either do a stress echo or a stress helium scan or nuclear isotope scan. Okay, right? So that's the thing that if there is a resting ECG abnormality, we will send the patient for either a stress echo, which means exercise echo, or a exercise nuclear scan. There is no resting ECG abnormalities. Then we look at is the patient able to exercise? If patient is able to exercise, then obviously just a stress test will do. If not able to exercise, then you will have to do that chemical induced test. So you'll do either a chemical dipyridamol thallium test or a dobutamine echo. All right. Now, doing all of this test, 
it means that you are trying to find out if the patient has got any reversible ischemia. If the test come back positive, the patient will go for angiogram. In the angiogram, you will be able to know how much blockage is there and what are the vessels that it has got involved. If it, if it is only one or two vessels which is blocked, then just stent. If three vessels has blocked, that patient will need a bypass surgery. Is this making sense now? Okay. Dr. Muid, the abnormal ECG is not the ST elevated MI. So try to understand that what is this abnormal ECG means. So the main thing you are, you are, you are actually confusing the stable angina with a myocardial infarction. In myocardial infarction, you will get the ECG abnormality as either a Q wave or you can get a ST elevation. Right? In that case, obviously, we don't need the patient to do exercise. This part is not for myocardial infarction patient. This part is for a stable angina patient who doesn't get any kind of symptoms if they don't do any exercise. That's why you are sending the patient for an exercise test. Yes, Dr. Sana, CABG is actually preferred for trivasal disease. So this three vessel disease, the preferred is bypass surgery. And also, Dr. Pfizer, in chemical stress test, why we can't see ischemic changes in ECG? Why we do echo? Now, many times, what happens that what we are looking for in the ECG? So many times, the ECG might not be the best, best test to give you the, all the ideas. Okay? Because when you give, when you give the do dobutamine, your heart is, heart is pumping faster. And just by doing an echo, you can know that if some part of the heart muscle is not moving as it should be. So ECG will not be able to pick if the heart muscle is moving or not. Only an echo can do that. Okay? And many of these patients will get an ECG as well, but that's not the part of the thing that we are looking for. We are looking for echo changes. Yes, for trivasal disease, bypass surgery is preferred, always. Now, these are a step-by-step -step approach. So it's not like we will, we will go directly to the CT angiogram or, a, or a, like, a, like a direct angiogram. We always follow the step. Okay, angiogram is, is obviously the best test, but it is not, not our initial investigation. Okay, these steps has to be followed before we go for an angiogram. Not every patient needs an angiogram. And again, many of you, you are confusing this baseline ECG abnormality with the MI ECG. Baseline, as I say multiple times, that baseline ECG abnormality means that the patient might be having a left ventricular hypertrophy, patient might be having a left bundle branch block, 
Okay. These are not the features of myocardial infarction, nor it is a feature of ischemic heart disease. Okay. So by getting LVH doesn't mean that patient has got a myocardial infarction or ischemic heart disease. So this baseline abnormality, what, why, it, why it, it is problematic? Because if you do this, then it can actually cause, cause confusion with the finding when you, when you send this patient for this test. Okay, so that's why we don't send this patient for when, when there is a baseline abnormality, we don't want to do this. Okay, so try to understand that these investigations we are doing for a patient who has got exercise induced angina, which is just basically a stable angina. And I already discussed how the nuclear stress test works. So in nuclear stress test, especially let's say that we are doing a nuclear scan. So you, the, they will put a dye in the patient's vein. The dye will go into the, into the heart myocardium. And then we will look that if a part of the myocardium is not taking enough blood supply. Okay, that's how the, the helium, helium scan works. And when we add a chemical to it, it means that patient can't exercise. So we are just we are just letting the heart to do exercise by giving this chemical. Okay, coming to that point. So it's not always that. So that's a good question, Doctor Faizia. So it's not always that patient has got a 20% block and you, are, you, you will just start the patient with a stenting. So a stenting has some, some definition for it. So that's where we come. You can see that stenosis less than 50% is insignificant. Surgically correctable disease generally begins with at least 70% stenosis. So only if a patient has got 70% stenosis in three vessels, then you go for bypass. Okay, we, if there is 50% block, that patient doesn't need to have any stenting or bypass. Okay. All right, moving on to next thing. But before that, okay, let's finish the halter and then we will take a break. So, Time to time in your question, you will see this halter monitoring in the auction. So what is this halter monitor? So halter monitor, it is a ambulatory ECG monitor that records your heart rhythm. So let's say a patient coming to you with feeling palpitations and you have done the ECG, but you can't find any ECG abnormality. But patient saying, doc, at night, my heart rate goes up to 180. So what will you do then? You will ask the patient to come at night? No. So you will send the patient for this halter monitor where a patient will put on a 24 hour ECG monitor and that ECG will record any kind of, any kind of rhythm disturbance patient had in the 24 hours. Okay, so halter monitoring is basically done to check for any rhythm disturbance, but it doesn't detect any ischemia. So if you're looking for ischemic heart disease, halter monitoring has nothing to do with it. But if a patient, you are looking for cause of palpitation or arrhythmia, then you do the halter monitor. Okay? So don't confuse this with anything else. All right, let's take a five minute break and then we will do some more discussion about, ischem about myocardial infarction. So we have finished the stable angina management. Now we will move into the myocardial infarction management, which is super important for your exam. Okay, so five minute break, guys.
All right, everyone, let's start again. Okay, some of your questions, let's answer that now. So is only a ECG taken in exercise stress test and chemical stress test? No. So sometimes in exercise stress test, yes, only ECG is taken. So in case of ETT, that's only the patient will run on a treadmill and they will take an ECG looking for any ischemic changes. That's why it is not like super base test. Chemical stress test, in chemical stress test, if we are looking for, yeah, in case of chemical stress test, such as in, in, in the thallium scan, let's say. So in thallium scan, the, it, is a myo, it is also known as myocardial perfusion scan. So it's not only just an just a ECG, they can also look directly into the, like they can look at the myocardium. So that means there is two pictures. One, they do a ECG, and they also also get a whole picture of the myocardial uptake of the scan. Okay, so in, in the myocardial uptake of the scan, they can at least they can they can find out that if a part of the heart muscle is not getting enough blood. Okay, so that's that's a really a really good test we do and commonly done in Australia. So the dye will pass into into the whole heart muscle. But if a part of the part of the artery is blocked, then this part of the heart muscle will not get enough scan or enough dye. So it's just like looking at the heart from outside. Okay. So there are two things that you can get from here. One is just the ECG abnormally. Also, you can get a full picture of the cardiac or myocardial like heart muscle. And Dr. Lali, so degree of stenosis and treatment. So if the patient having at least 70% blockers, and if there is only one or two vessel having 70% or more than 70% blockers, then ideally the patient will go for stenting, which is angioplasty. And if a patient has got three vessel disease, which means three of the vessel having more than equal to 70% block, then the patient will go for bypass surgery. Okay. Brief repetition of halter monitoring. So halter monitor is it's a 24 hour monitoring of the heart rhythm disturbance. So if you are looking for someone who is having palpitation and you have done a resting ECG, there is nothing you have found out, then you do the halter monitor. Sometimes what can happen that at rest or when the patient came to you, there is nothing wrong. But when they go home or they're doing an exercise, something has triggered it. And the halter monitor at that time will be able to pick up. Okay. And with abnormal ECG, yeah, you can do any of those. So as we say that if a patient having an abnormal ECG, then you can do a stress echo. You can also do a stress nuclear test. Any of this is fine. It's not a, it's not a problem. We are not, not worried about, about the patient to have a myocardial infarction. We never can know, but it is unlikely because we will only send very stable patients to this kind of investigations. If we think that patient is not stable, patient has high risk, then we will send the patient directly for angiogram sometimes. Okay, so those are different scenarios, but we will we will follow the follow the step by step approach for AMC. Now coming to MI management, let's start with a question. Okay, let's not do this one. Let's start with just some discussion first, then we will go to your go to that question later on. So always remember if a patient coming to you with myocardial infarction features, what is your most important thing that you will do straight away? What do you think, guys? So you have got a patient with ST elevated MI. 
That means you have already done the ECG. What will you do next? Aspirin. Very good. Very good, Dr. Dr. Sabin, Dr. Faizia. Yeah, very good. You do a loading dose. Very good. Loading dose of aspirin, not clopidogrel, just aspirin. So you'll give it 300 milligram aspirin straight away. And we call it as a Mona therapy. What is Mona? Mona, the main thing is aspirin. Then you can give nitroglycerin if the patient having chest pain, even after giving morphine. So aspirin, morphine for chest pain. If there is not severe chest pain, you don't need to give morphine all the time. Even after morphine, patient having chest pain, you can give nitroglycerin. And if the oxygen saturation less than 95, then you will give oxygen. So monotherapy is the first line that you can try. But many times question will come in the exam that after giving aspirin, what is the next thing that you want to do in a patient with ST elevated MI? The next thing you want to do is to send the patient straight to the catheter lab because you don't have much time. Ideally, in a real life scenario, you will give morphine, you will give nitroglycerin, but as part of the exam scenario, you, you will always choose catheter lab or for a, for, this means you have to send the patient for catheter lab after aspirin. That's what I would like you guys to remember because we will come into the discussion later on, but it is an important scenario. They want you to understand that what is the most important thing for a patient who has a ST elevated MI to remove the clot. And that's, that comes with catheter lab. Okay, so always remember aspirin first and then send the patient for catheter lab. Why not clopidogrel? Because clopidogrel can increase the risk of bleeding. You are sending this patient for, for an emergency surgery, right? And if you give clopidogrel, this patient can bleed a lot. And anyway, if the patient going to the catheter lab, they're going to have either, they're going to have the, the clot removed anyway. So you don't need to necessarily give a clopidogrel right now. Okay? So we don't give clopidogrel initially before sending the patient to catheter lab. So that's what is written in here. So early treatment should be initiated with aspirin. Now, clopidogrel usually will be avoided. So avoid clopidogrel in patients likely to require emergency coronary bypass surgery. If possible, discontinue clopidogrel five days before the bypass surgery. And sometimes you can use Tika Griller in addition to aspirin for acute coronary syndrome. Now, what we normally do in a real life scenario is that we start the patient with aspirin. We, we will give all of those treatment like Mona. Patient with ST elevated MI will go to the catheter lab, will have a PCI. And later on, after the surgery, patient will be put on, put on the clopidogrel. Okay. So it's not that you have to start clopidogrel straight away before sending the patient for reperfusion surgery or revascularization surgery. So medical management, the main thing is aspirin. That's the main thing that we need to know. Now, what else can be done? Give unfractionated heparin or subcutaneous enogeparin until angiography or for 48 to 72 hours. This is also given in patients with non-ST elevated MI. We will come into those discussions just in a bit. Let's have a look to this question. A 70-year-old woman comes to the emergency department with a crushing substernal chest pain for the last hour. And ECG shows ST segment elevation V2 to V4. So you have got a patient, 70-year-old, coming within one hour of chest pain, showing ST elevated MI. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? So I hope you all, all of you know the answer. So it is aspirin, right? Do we need to do a troponin? No. So the main thing we will do in this case is aspirin. Now, 
You can see here, aspirin lowers mortality with acute coronary syndrome, and it is critical to administer as rapidly as possible. Now, within one hour of symptom onset, neither the CKMB nor troponin will be elevated, right? Morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin should all be administered, but they do not lower mortality and therefore not as important as aspirin. Aspirin should be given simultaneously with activating the catheter lab. Clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor is indicated when patient has intolerance of aspirin or has already undergone angioplasty with a stenting. So after putting the stent, you can put the patient on clopidogrel when the patient will be discharged. Okay, so that's one question. The second question, which comes in exam so frequently, the same patient, 70 year old, EKG shows ST elevation, patient having pain for one hour, aspirin has been given to the patient to chew. What is the most appropriate next step for the management of this patient? So the best thing would be, if there is an option of catheter lab, that would be the best. But in here, angioplasty is our best. So angioplasty is basically percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI, which will, which will happen in catheter lab. So what is catheter lab? It's just a, a, a you can say, cardiac intervention unit. So in, in that unit, the patient will undergo percutaneous coronary intervention and through the PCI, the patient will either go for an angioplasty or if needed, a bypass surgery. It depends, okay? So always remember, the patient will need all of these, oxygen, nitroglycerin, morphine, everything is needed. But in these cases, we will always think aspirin followed by catheter lab for angioplasty or bypass, okay? The other question, now this kind of questions usually never will come in exam, Dr. Jaina, that if let's say they have given oxygen 90%, should we give aspirin or oxygen? For, for coronary artery, aspirin comes first, always. As you can see here, morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin should all be administered, but they do not lower mortality, therefore are not as important as aspirin. So you'll need to give oxygen to that patient, obviously, but aspirin can save the cardiac muscle. So that's always the first line. Okay, have a look in here. Angioplasty is associated with the greatest mortality benefit of all the steps listed in the above question. All of the answers are partially correct because most of them will be done for this patient. Again, morphine, oxygen, nitrate should be given to the patient immediately, but they do not clearly lower the mortality. Okay, so mortality benefit is the most important thing in this case. Now, for ST elevated MI, there are two options. One option is sending the patient to the catheter lab for angioplasty. Now, what if you don't have a catheter lab at all in your, in your hospital and you can't send the patient to the tertiary hospital in the reasonable time. The other option is giving some thrombolytics. So thrombolytic agents will be the next choice in that case. So both thrombolytics and angioplasty is, a, is an option in these cases. And this is only an option for ST elevated MI patient, not for unstable angina, not, not for non-ST non elevated MI. Remember that, okay? And these two can only be given if patient comes within 12 hours of 
symptom onset. After 12 hours, doing this doesn't, ma doesn't matter. Okay? But within 12 hours, if patient comes to you, this has to be done. So between thrombolytics and angioplasty, best is angioplasty. If angioplasty is not available, then thrombolytics. We'll go into a little bit more discussion about these two later on, so hang on. Have a look on this question. A man comes to the emergency with chest pain for the last hour that is crushing in quality, doesn't change with respiration or position. ECG shows ST segment depression. So this is not ST elevation, rather it's ST depression in B2, B4. Aspirin has been given. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? Low molecular weight heparin, thrombolytics, and you have got this glycoprotein, nitroglycerin, morphine, angioplasty, metoprolol. So the answer in here is A. Why? Because it looks like, so for the one hour, patient having this crushing chest pain, and ECG showing features of ischemia. So even ST segment depression can be found, can be found either in non-ST elevated MI or unstable angina. We don't know it's still. We can only differentiate between these two by doing a troponin. But the problem is that the option is not here. So doing a troponin is not here as the option. And for if the pain is just for one hour, doing troponin might not even give you the give you the the the, the elevated troponin in this case. Now the, the thing is that if there was a troponin in the option, would you do it in this case? Yes, we would do it. In, a, in many patients, you can actually get elevated troponin even within one hour. And as a baseline, you can still do a troponin. It's not like you can't do, you can do it. Because if you, can, if you get elevated troponin by any way, you already can differentiate between an unstable angina and a, and a non ST elevated AMI. So, in the next step, if there was a troponin, yes, you could do it because that can at least give us some idea about this problem. But in case if troponin is not in the option and, and let's say troponin is normal, you can't wait for the troponin to be elevated. So you will prophylactically manage this patient as non-ST elevated MI. And for non-ST elevated MI, after aspirin, heparin is the best step. Okay, so that's what they have written. Heparin will prevent a clot from forming in the coronary arteries. It, do, it doesn't dissolve the clot that has already formed. When the patient has ACS and there is no ST segment elevation, there is no benefit of doing a thrombolytic therapy. Nitroglycerin, morphine, oxygen are not associated with a clear reduction in mortality. So, mortality benefit is always important in these cases. Okay? So, there is tremendous urgency to give heparin immediately because we want to prevent the clot from growing further and closing of the coronary artery. That's the main reason because this patient is still have a little bit of patency in their coronary artery. And if you allow it to grow more, the likely chance this non-ST elevated MI will become a ST elevated MI. So to prevent that to happen, you will start the patient with heparin straight away. Okay, here guys, so what I'm trying to, trying to give information to you that for ST elevated MI, aspirin followed by catheter lab. Okay, for non-ST elevated MI, aspirin followed by heparin. That's the, the basic thing that you should retain in your head after all these discussions. So there are lots of summary of medication that we provide in this kind of patient. So obviously beta blocker 
nitrates, those will be given later on, but it's not the part of acute management. Same with the statin, that those will be added later on, not right now. Now have a look on this invasive management. What if the patient has got a non ST elevated MI? That means there is obviously some blockage in the coronary artery. Are we not going to do an angiogram with that patient? Obviously. So it's not as urgent like, like you have to just do a, do a PCI straight away. But patient who has non ST elevated MI, ideally within 48 hours, you will send this patient for a coronary angiogram. And if the coronary angiogram shows high grade blockage, then you will put the stent in. Okay, so that will be the treatment, like their, their last treatment in this case. Now, coming back to ST elevated MI, we already discussed about all of this. We discussed about initial management. That's fine. Now, have a look on this one. First, this one, patient with ST elevated MI usually have a completely occluded coronary artery, which leads to myonecrosis. And that's why restoring the coronary patency as promptly as possible is a key dominant, key determinant of short-term and long-term outcome. So your basic or your main, main idea is to restore the coronary artery patency. And how you do that? You by doing the PCI or thrombolytics. So patient with ST elevated MI who present within 12 hours of onset of symptoms should have a reperfusion strategy. Reperfusion can be done either a fibrinolytic therapy, which is thrombolytic, or a PCI. Which one is best? PCI. Patient presenting with non ST elevated MI will not benefit from thrombolytics. Okay? So this is from JM. Now, what are the typical findings from ST elevated MI? For ST elevated MI, immediately, patient will start to get a hyper acute tall T wave. So you get tall T wave followed by ST elevation. Then over several days, patient develops Q wave and they can also develop T wave inversion. Now it might be quite tricky for you to understand now, but we will discuss these things later on in ECG class. Now the main thing is the reperfusion therapy in, in ST elevated MI. So choice of reperfusion is between either a PCI or a thrombolytic. PCI is the best. So PCI improves the outcome in every patient with ST elevated MI presenting within 12 hours compared to thrombolytics. Now the problem happens, there is a little bit confusing word written in JM. In general, a time delay of 90 minutes from the first medical encounter to the PCI is the maximum desirable. So there are two things. One is this 90 minute and one is 12 hours. Don't confuse these two timing. This 90 minute delay is ideally when a patient comes into your medical door or emergency department with the ST elevated MI, the best thing is that you need to arrange catheter lab and the PCI for that patient within 90 minutes. Delaying more than that is not practical and not logical. But what if there is a delay? You can still do it. It's not like you can't do it after 90 minutes. You can do it, but it is not practical. Okay? So that's different from that 12 hours. 12 hours is, is the ideal time that if a patient presents within, within 12 hours of chest pain, you can still, still do the PCI or, or thrombolytic therapy in that patient. Okay? What if patient comes after 12 hours? After 12 hours, doing it urgently will not make any change. So what will you do? You will start the general treatment and you will try to take the patient for a coronary angiogram and, and you, can, you, can, you will do a stenting later on if needed, but it's not as urgent like, like this. Because after 12 hours, if you do a coronary intervention urgently, it will not 
not change the outcome that much. Okay. And then you have got thrombolytics. Thrombolytics are either you can use a streptokinase or any of the tissue type plasminogen activator. What they do, they just dissolve the clot. And you can see here the greatest benefit is in patients with ST elevation who have had symptoms less than 12 hours. So for both thrombolytics and PCI, ideal time is less than 12 hours. But not all the patient can have thrombolytic therapy. So if a patient has got active bleeding, if a patient has got ischemic stroke within the last three months, history of intracerebral hemorrhage, you can't go for you can't go for thrombolytics in that case. And if you can't have PCI and you can't have thrombolytics, that's a very bad situation. Now that this kind of tricky things will not come in your exam because that's the specialist job. Okay, so don't think that much complex for this MCQ exam just yet. So you can see the late presentation. So every, you have a lot of questions which will be answered. Don't worry on that. If a patient ha comes to you after 12 hours of symptom onset, then what will you do? You will obviously do reperfusion therapy. Either you will do a PCI or fibrinolysis. But it is not important that much. So you can see here, reperfusion therapy is not routinely recommended in patients who are asymptomatic and hemodynamically stable and who presents after 12 hours of symptom onset. So reperfusion therapy with a coronary stenting or a fibrinolysis is not routinely needed. But you can just, you will need to send the patient for coronary angiogram anyway. So in that case, patient might need patient might need any of those. So patient might need a CABG. Patient also sometimes can be a candidate of a PCI. So it depends. Okay. So not everyone will have CABG. Patient can just need a stenting also. So it depends on how much blockage is there. The the main thing that you need to understand that it's all about how urgently you are treating the patient. If a patient with ST elevated MI comes within 12 hours of symptom onset, you will do your best to do the percutaneous coronary intervention within 90 minutes of presenting into your hospital. Okay? If PCI is not possible or not available, then go for thrombolytics. What if after 12 hours patient comes to you, if patient is asymptomatic, hemodynamically stable, you don't need to do anything urgently. Okay, you can you can wait, and maybe just within within 48 to 72 hours you can arrange a coronary angiogram, and then you can decide which one you will do. Clear, everyone? So for both, you will do aspirin and angio within 90 minutes and 12 hours. So I guess what I'm not understanding is the urgency. You said you have to urgently do. Yeah, so there are two things. One is 12 hours of symptom onset. So understand the scenario. So if a patient presents to you within 12 hours of ischemic chest pain and you have found ST elevated MI, then it is recommended to do a percutaneous coronary intervention or thrombolytics based on the availability. Now let's say you want to do a PCI for this patient and patient fulfills the criteria. Now ideally you should not delay more than 90 minutes from the time patient entered into your hospital and then went into the catheter lab. So from hospital to catheter lab, you should not delay more than 90 minutes. Is this clear?
Great. Okay. And have you guys got what to do after 12 hours presentation? Now, even after 12 hours, patient most of the time will have a ST elevation. Right? So it all depends. It all depends about the hemodynamic stability. If the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic, if patient is symptomatic, you can still take the patient for, for this reperfusion therapy. It's not like you can't. You can, but the thing is that patient might not get the full, full outcome as they would do if they would come before 12 hours. Yes, if even after 12 hours patient comes to you, your first thing would be aspirin. That's right. And if patient is hemodynamically stable, and if patient is asymptomatic, then reperfusion immediately is not urgent. So you will you will just look at you will start with the general management aspirin. You will you can give it, you can give all the monotherapy, and then you can maybe within the next forty eight hours you can arrange a coronary angiogram, and based on the finding you can either go for an angioplasty or a bypass. So ideally, you'll have to do that, but it's all about urgency. When patient comes within 12 hours, you have more chance to, to, to do a better outcome for the patient. But after 12 hours, it's no longer an urgent case. Yes, immediately, Dr. Pfizer. So coronary, so if patient comes within 12 hours, that PCI that you are doing, that, that actually will involve the angiogram and everything. Okay, all right. So I hope that that makes some sense in these cases because this is quite confusing for a lot of candidates, and I understand why it is confusing because it is written very confusingly in in in. It. So, lastly, when a patient develops myocardial infarction and you you treat those patients, there are always some possibility of complication, but they sometimes ask they they ask you that. What is the most common cause of cardiac death after a myocardial infarction? The commonest one is ventricular fibrillation. Some other that can happen is that sometimes they can develop some valvular disruptions. They can even develop a post-infarct angina. So you have done a PCI or a thrombolytic. Even after that patient develops a post-infarct angina. And any patient who develops angina or chest pain after a thrombolytic or PCI, should be treated with a bypass surgery. And there is a condition called Dresler syndrome, which is patient who had myocardial infarction and they, you have treated, but now presenting with pericarditis like chest pain. So that's Dresler syndrome. And the treatment is just like pericarditis chest pain. So you'll treat them with aspirin or NSAIDs. Few other topics is fringe metal angina or variant angina. So fringe metal angina is uncommon, but in these cases, angina triggered by one of the coronary arteries suddenly goes into a spasm. Okay, so this fringe metal angina usually occurs during rest, sometimes even at night time and early morning hours. So. If you do a ECG on this patient during the episodes, you'll get ST elevation. So that's the confusing part. But you have got ST segment elevation, then when you do a coronary angiogram, that will come back normal. So that's the time you will think that, well, it's not coronary artery disease itself. So it could be pins metal. Then you can do a test called argonovin, argonovin test. This argonovin can cause coronary artery spasm. And if you get, when you give argonovin and you do a ECG after that, if ECG shows ST elevation, you confirm that it is Prince metal. Because coronary artery goes into a spasm in this case, you have to give something which can dilate the coronary artery. So what you can give? Calcium channel blocker or nitrates. Okay. All right.
right so let's have a look to your question so but in gm it's given as if target is not achieved that is within 90 minutes of onset of st uh, no it's not like that dr Pereira. so in gym they haven't actually written something like that that if you can't go for uh, pci within 90 minutes you will go for fibrinolytic it's not like that it's both of this fibrinolytic and pci ideally it has to be done within 12 hours okay so we say that let's say you are in a rural hospital and your your tertiary hospital where the pci is possible is let's say more than 90 minutes away so obviously you if you send the patient to the tertiary hospital it will be too much delay so in that case you will not send the patient you will rather just do it thrombolytics in your rural hospital does it make sense that that's one of the one of the scenario that comes in exam you are in a rural hospital your your nearest tertiary hospital where there is a catheter lab is three hours away are you going to wait for three hours no you will just start the patient with thrombolytics in that case okay but if the patient is in tertiary hospital if pci is available we will try our best to go for pci Yeah, heparin, heparin has not, no role in ST elevated MI. Heparin is mainly for non ST elevated MI. Why? Because heparin cannot dissolve the clot. In ST elevated MI, patients already, the full, full coronary artery is already blocked. So heparin usually prevents further clot formation. So giving heparin is not going to do anything in ST elevated MI. But it can help in non ST elevated MI because it is preventing to form further clot. Okay. Now, the last one is aortic dissection. So aortic dissection, we already know that these patients will have a sudden onset of severe midline retrosternal chest pain, which feels like tearing or ripping sensation, and ideally it goes towards back. It can also radiate to the abdomen, flank, and legs. You can get inequality in pulse and inequality in blood pressure. Okay. Now, if you think the patient having aortic dissection, the best investigation is transesophageal echocardiogram. You, if transesophageal echo is not available, you can also do a CT angiogram. Treatment. So aortic dissection, the Let's see if we have got an image here. No. So if you look here, so you have got brachiocephalic artery, left carotid, and left subclavian artery, right? And this is the aorta. So this is your ascending aorta, and then it goes as descending aorta, right? Now, aortic dissection means there is a tear in this aorta. This tear has been divided into type A and type B. So if the tear happens proximal to this subclavian artery, that's called type A, aortic dissection. If the tear happens distal to the left subclavian artery, that's type B. Now, type A has bad because it is more closer to the heart for type a patient will need emergency surgery so emergency surgery needed for many especially for type a but for type b your initial management is is controlling the blood pressure because most of these patients will have a significantly high blood pressure but you can't give something which will rapidly drop the blood pressure also so ideally we say that the, the initial blood pressure medication is IV beta blocker, which is labetalol. So labetalol will be your first line antihypertensive for this patient. 
And after labetalol, if it still it is high, then you can try the IV nitroprusside. Okay. And later on, if needed, patient can have surgery. All good. So that's the treatment of aortic dissection. It comes in exam. So make sure you know about it. And pulmonary embolism, we will not discuss it tonight. We will discuss it in our respiratory class in detail. There are some some of these links given in here, you can also go through this. So aortic dissection from med bullets, you can go through it. There is some discussion in here also from Medescape or e-medicine, which you can read later on. Okay, so that's all about today's class, guys. I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope it cleared up a lot of confusion about this, this cardiac problem. This is confusing a lot, but I hope now you should not be confused at least these questions are mastery questions in the exam and usually software doesn't like when you miss these kind of questions you can you don't need to because everything that we have discussed Better Pfizer, that's more than enough for cardiologists, at least for the myocardial infarction and disease stops. The other part of cardiology will be discussed in our next class, especially heart failure, hypertension, those things. Okay, so if we summarize the management, so let's say we, we have got a patient with, with a ST elevated MI. If we will start the patient with aspirin, as our first line treatment we will obviously do all those oxygen morphine those are always there but they don't actually do any any mortality benefit so best if the patient presents within 12 hours then we will send the patient for pci or thrombolytics depending on the availability okay that's the only thing that you should remember and if the patient having possibility of non-ST elevated MI, then you start with aspirin and give heparin. There is no role of thrombolytics or PCI in a patient with non-ST elevated MI. Some other things is that if a patient presents after 12 hours of onset of chest pain in ST elevated MI, what can I do? So ideally, you don't need to do anything urgently. You will treat the patient as you are treating a ST elevated MI, but it is not urgent like when a patient comes within 12 hours. You will electively do an angiogram, and based on the angiogram report, you will either go for an angioplasty or bypass. Okay? Now, for a stable angina patient where patient doesn't show any ECG changes at rest, you have to do a stress test. So we discussed about some of those stress testing, so go through that. We will give you a recording of this class as well in, in the YouTube. If you are still confused to go through the recordings a little bit, that should clear it up. And obviously, for those of you who are already in the course, you will get, get the note and recording in the portal. Okay. Yes, Dr. Gina. So there will be a telegram group for discussing the MCQ for all course candidates. So all of this will be done after these two week sessions is over, we will go through all of those. And also the QBank will be uploaded after the two weeks, okay? So is there any questions guys about the course or anything that you want to know? Of? So the course has already started as you know. So if any of you missed those sessions, the recording is already given in, in the YouTube. Also, the link of the recording given in the First Aid AMC MCQ. That's the Facebook group. You can always just search by writing recording and you should get all the recordings that's there. Or you can just go to our YouTube and you can find it out. Okay. So that's the, the way to way to get the missed sessions. Now as you can understand that the course has already started 
on 8th of October. So you are actually doing our course classes at the moment, but we, we always allow these two week sessions for anyone to understand about this course, understand how, you, how, we, how we take the classes so that you don't feel that after two months, you don't feel that, well, no, what if I would join another course? So we make sure that you are satisfied before you join the class, okay? So I hope that you are feeling good. I hope you are learning some things and that's more than enough for us, okay? And all, you can always get all the course, course details and everything in our Facebook group, in our website. So if I show you our Facebook group, that would be the best to get everything. Just one second. If you go to our first aid AMC MCQ, you will always see that we always keep our, see, in the featured section or announcement section, you will always get the updated course detail. And we always put the important information here anyway. So that's one thing. And you can see that it's already live streaming in here. So other thing is that all the class details for these two week sessions, so the Zoom ID and everything, usually we post multiple times before the class. The schedule is given here. So everything is already here. And you can see I have put the recording of the last class here as well. So if you don't want to scroll that much, you can always just write recording in the search box. And all the recordings will come here. Okay, so this point, this psychiatry recording, so all the recordings will come in here. So that's one of the way to get. The other one is you can also go to our First Aid AMC website. So let me share that one as well. So if you write firstaidamc.com, So if you just type firstaidamc.com, the website will come up. And in the website, you can also just go through our course details from here. So all the details of the, of the classes, course, everything is written in here. You can go through that if you need. And we post these details a lot in our Facebook group also. So anything that you want to know, you can go through here. And if you want to start joining the course, then I would recommend that you send us either send me a message in my inbox under Dr. Arshan Ahmed. So that's one thing, or you can also send it to our email. So email address is given here. So you can send it into our email and one of our team members will help you in this regard. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tharindu, if you are doing exam in next year, September, October, it's been, it will be one year. Yes, the content will be changed over one year because we always update our question solve classes. The theory classes doesn't change that much, but yes, the question solve classes will be changed. Yes, all the videos have password in the portal. The password is given in the portal also, Dr. Sabin, and just copy paste or just write that password into that box. Oh, good. So that's it for tonight, guys. We'll see you in the next class. And hopefully you're enjoying the session. So hopefully you're learning something. And that's all that we want. Dr. Faiz, your password should be working. If it doesn't work, send it to our messenger. We'll have a look. And also just send a screenshot of what which one is not working. Okay. All right. So that's it for tonight, guys. Let's finish it here. Start reading these topics by yourself also. After the class, I would recommend to finish this within one to two days because everything is still in your head. You can finish it within within few hours. Okay. Thanks all. Have a good night. Take care.